Good morning once again. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans. If you have no idea where that is, it's in the New Testament, past the Gospels, keep going right past Acts, and you'll be there. Romans chapter 11, we've got a few more studies left in this chapter, this Sunday and next Sunday. Romans chapter 11, this morning we're going to be looking at verses 25 through 32 in a message that I'm entitling, God's Mystery and Mercy, God's Mystery and Mercy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for Jesus just as we've worshiped, Lord, that it is true that we have the Lord Jesus. He is our priest and our sacrifice. He's the satisfying solution to the problem of sin. And Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have a plan and that the plan is unfolding. That human history will come to a sharp and dramatic and abrupt Halt, and that the promises that you've made to the nations and to Israel will soon be completed. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you would prepare our hearts, that Lord, we would begin to both believe and embrace the reality of the promises that you've made. And Heavenly Father, because you've been faithful to Israel, you'll be faithful to us. And so, Heavenly Father, we commit this time to you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 25, Paul writes, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should... Be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I shall take away their sins concerning the gospel they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet now have obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so, these also have now been disobedient that you, or that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. In the last three chapters, Paul speaks of Israel's spiritual past in chapter 9. Israel's spiritual present in chapter 10. Israel's spiritual future in chapter 11. Paul asks and answers the question, has God permanently cast aside his people? And Paul's repeated answer is no. God has not permanently cast aside Israel. God has a plan for the Jewish people. And God's plan for the Jewish people will unfold and it will come to fruition. And Paul has offered himself as proof in verse 1. He offers Israel's history as proof and reminds the Roman readers that the remnant of Jewish believers in every generation continues in, chapter, in verses 2 through 10. And then Paul offers what I call a dispensational proof. In verses 11 through 24, he gives the parable of an olive tree, 
A salvation tree where branches are severed and branches are connected. And that the fall of Israel has in part meant the rise of the Gentiles. And that that fall has brought blessing to the world. And a future and greater blessing will take place when the restoration occurs. He's talking about the restoration of Israel. Paul offers scriptural proof. In chapters 9, 10, and 11, he cited the Old Testament passages over and over again to reinforce his arguments. And in this section, in verses 25 through 36, Paul is going to turn to Isaiah, chapter 59, verses 20 and 21. He's going to turn to Isaiah again in chapter 27, verse 9. He is going to Turn to the book of Psalms in chapter 14, verse 7, to show that the Messiah, the Deliverer, will cleanse Israel and will restore Israel. Paul speaks of a mystery, Israel's blindness, and then he introduces a phrase The fullness of the Gentiles in verse 25. Paul uses a word, mystery. It's the Greek word, musterion. In the Bible, when it speaks of a mystery, it's not like a whodunit. It isn't like watching the Hallmark Channel and and, um, watching a TV series about a crime that's committed and then trying to figure out the crime. In the Bible, when it uses this term mystery, it refers to a truth that was hidden by God in times past, but is now understood in the present time. And this becomes a key, key concept. It means revealed by God. It means to be understood by God's people. And so the fullness of the Gentiles is an expression which I believe refers to the number of Gentiles that will be saved during the church age. I think the expression incorporates the idea of the numbers of the Gentiles saved, but it also incorporates the concept of the completion of the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. As we live and breathe right at this very moment, people are coming into the kingdom. People are being saved. People are being regenerated. They're washed. They're cleansed. They're placed into the body of Christ. But there's going to come a time. There's going to come a day in which the last Gentile will make the last confession of faith, the last profession of embracing the Lord Jesus Christ as his Lord and his Savior. And the body of Christ will be complete. The bride of Christ will have come to fruition. And so I'm going to suggest to you that This begins at Pentecost and continues to the rapture of the church. And Paul has alluded to the details of the time period. He's alluded to the reasons for it to provoke Israel to jealousy in verse 14. That they may return to the Lord and find favor through the Lord Jesus Christ in verses 11 and 12. And that Paul himself has been appointed by God for the very task of preaching the gospel and reaching first the Jew and then the Gentile. And so he speaks of the mystery in verses 25 and 26 and the mercy in verses 27 through 32. Let's look at verse 25 because this is the key passage right here. In verse 25 he says, For I do not desire brethren... That you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness has in part happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. I'll be honest with you. As I was looking at the passage, I was thinking I could spend the whole study on this one verse. 
But in the interest of brevity and clarity, I'm not going to do that. But we have to talk about a few, a few things. Number one, Paul's concern about spiritual and prophetic ignorance on the part of the Roman reader. But now, you, because you're reading it. And so he's going to be talking about the partial explanation for Israel's blindness. What is it about the Jew and what is it about the Jewish people that there seems to be this hardened, recalcitrant refusal to believe that Jesus is the Messiah? And then he's going to talk about the fullness of the Gentiles. So he speaks of ignorance and mystery. And remember, my previous definition, what we've already shared about the word mystery, hidden truth not revealed in the Old Testament, declared and explained in the New Testament. And by the way, there are 12 such mysteries that are spoken of in the New Testament. There's the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, number one. There's the mystery of the church and the body of Christ, number two. There's the mystery of the church as the bride of Christ, Number three. Number four, the mystery of the indwelling Christ. Number five, the mystery of the incarnate Christ. Number six, the mystery of godliness. Number seven, the mystery of iniquity. Number eight, the mystery of Israel's present blindness, which is what we're focusing on here in chapter 11, verse 25. Number nine, the mystery of the seven stars spoken of in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. Number 10, the mystery of Babylon, the harlot. And what the Bible calls number 11, the mystery of God in Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. And then, of course, the Bible speaks of the mystery of the rapture. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And in many of these mysteries, he joins together the issue of ignorance. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul speaks of being stewards or caretakers entrusted with the mysteries of God. And he uses, and the Bible uses this term, ignorance, in at least six ways. Number one, about the ignorance of the messianic prophecies in Acts chapter 3, verse 17. And then the ignorance of God's purpose in changing circumstances, which he's already talked about in Romans chapter 1, verse 13. And then the ignorance about those who have died and what's going to happen to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. The ignorance about spiritual gifts. And this becomes really, really important because if you want to see something where people are confused, talk about the rapture, talk about spiritual gifts, talk about prophecy. He talks about ignorance of suffering in the life of the believer in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. And so whether you're talking about the promises of Messiah, whether you're talking about Ignorance of God and God's changing purposes. Paul points out these things because he's trying to bring you to a place where you will begin to understand and, and clarify these important issues. And by the way, Peter speaks of those who are ignorant about the delay of the second coming of Jesus in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. So Paul will move from his concern about the spiritual ignorance to the character of the mystery and the condition of Israel. Blindness has occurred in part. And by the way, that simple phrase tells us that the blindness is partial. And then the simple phrase, until the fullness of the Gentiles, means that it's has a time span. It's taking place right now. And that it's prophetic. That it will occur until the time of the Gentiles be complete. Or till the fullness of the Gentiles come in. So the blindness or the hardness of Israel 
is limited. It's only going to take place in part. And so what we understand is that the blindness is not true of every single Jewish person. There are some Jewish people, many Jewish people, who have embraced Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so the blindness or the hardness will also have an end until the fullness of the Gentiles. The blindness will be lifted. The hardness will be removed. And note, and this becomes important, Paul ties the destiny of the Jew with the destiny of the Gentile and the destiny of the Gentile with the destiny of the Jew. They're related. They're dependent upon one another. And this becomes really, really important. So what is the meaning of that term? The fullness of the Gentiles. Some Bible teachers take it to mean the number of the Gentiles that will be saved during the time of the church age. If that's true, then it begins, if you will, at the time of the second chapter of Acts and continues until the last person, the last person, the last person comes into a right relationship with God in Christ. And if that's you, stop holding us up. What are you thinking? It's time. It's time to get right with God. It's time to get saved. Others suggest that the fullness of the Gentiles may have some reference to the unfolding plan that God has for the Gentile nations. That it began with the collapse of Jerusalem, the sacking, if you will, by Babylon. And many of you are familiar with the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah, how God would come and remove Israel and take them to the land of Babylon. And many of you are familiar with Daniel's dream, if you will. It's not Daniel's dream, it's Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which Daniel interprets. And you'll remember there was a statue with a head of gold and breastplate of silver, if you will. And it spoke of the time of Babylon and the time of the Greeks and the time of the Persians and the time of the Romans that there would be this unfolding business that God has a plan for the Jew but he also has a plan for the Gentile and that human history is going in a particular direction and it's going to come to a specific consummation and you come to the legs of, of iron and clay, the Roman Empire. And then of a future empire, a future Gentile world power. Jesus said in Luke chapter 21 verse 24, it gives us a clue. Jesus said, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. When Jesus spoke those words... Jerusalem was occupied by a foreign power, Rome. After the collapse of Jerusalem, Babylon takes over. The Greeks then take over. And then the Romans take over. But as we march forward into human history, we'll see something. And that is Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Jerusalem has been preoccupied, if you will, and occupied with foreign powers. It wasn't until 1967, it wasn't until 1967 that a Jewish army liberated this Jewish city and declared that Jerusalem will be the Jews' capital from time, from now until eternity. The Jewish people said, Jerusalem, it will be the united, not divided capital of Jerusalem, or of, of God forever, or, or the, the people. Is that true? I wish I could say that it was true. I wish I could tell you that there was never a time where Jerusalem wasn't specifically occupied by the Jewish people and then taken over again. It has happened in history. It happened during the Maccabean period. There was a brief, brief moment of Jewish independence before Pompey annexed Jerusalem into the Roman Empire. 
And then it was briefly, briefly taken over again by a group of of Jewish zealots from 131 AD to 134 AD. Is Jerusalem now occupied until the coming of Christ? I can't tell you with certainty that that's true. But I can tell you with certainty that what Jesus said is true. That Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles. And by the way, for all intents and purposes, even though the Jewish people occupy the city of Jerusalem, it is still trodden down by the Gentiles. It is still held by the the Gentiles. The, The Temple Mount itself is still tenaciously, perniciously held on to by the Muslim authority. But here's what I can tell you for sure. This is what the Bible says. And it must come true. That an age will come to fruition. An age will come to end. And a new age will will begin. The kingdoms of men will become the kingdom of God. And with the close of this age will come the opening of Jewish eyes and a Jewish heart. And Jerusalem will no longer be trodden down by the Gentiles. And God's prophetic attention as it relates to the Jewish people will come into full force. The time has a limit, in part. The time will come to an end, until. The time will experience restoration and recovery, all saved. Look at verse 26. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, Paul says, the deliverer will come out of Zion and He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Remember what's happened. Paul has gone to extraordinary lengths to argue. Israel's rejection, not total, verses 1 through 25. Israel's rejection, not permanent, verses 26 through 32. So what does Paul mean? I'm going to suggest to you that it might mean that at the close of the dispensation of the Gentiles, the church age, that abundant grace and abundant mercy available now to individuals will be made available to the nations and will be poured out, poured out on the Jewish people. But look what it says, the deliverer will come out of Zion. Some of you might read that and you might think, wait a minute. The deliverer has come out of Zion. And you would be right. Jesus, the deliverer, has come out of Zion. Jesus, both high priest and sacrifice, is our deliverer from sin and our savior. He writes, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He has come. That's true. He will come. That's also true. You see, I'm going to suggest to you that Jesus came to deliver and that delivery has meant for the most part beneficence, salvation, redemption, forgiveness for some but not necessarily for the Jewish people as a whole. Roy Lauren suggests that the first truly, truly Christian nation will ironically turn out to be Israel. There have been groups, Armenia. There have been groups, parts of Russia. There have been groups in what's now Turkey and Anatolia. There have been little pockets of redemption where Christians have gathered and and where they have had a Christian community and they've tried to embrace Christian principles based on Christian living. But the truth is, the truth is that a real deliverer will come to Jerusalem and he will make his throne in the city of David and he will occupy Occupy that throne and it will be Christ himself. The Jewish people will have a Christian king. 
Jesus will rule the nations. The government will be on his shoulders. He will be sovereign. He came the first time for a cross, but now he will come for a crown. He came in shame, but he will come in glory. And the Bible speaks of the Israel of God and the God of Israel, the Gentile nation. And the Gentile story and the Gentile history comes to a close. And there's a new king and a new kingdom. Paul quotes Isaiah 59 20. The Redeemer will come to Zion. And to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. When Paul says... And so all Israel will be saved. Does he mean every last Jew? No. I don't think that that's what he's talking about. I think what Paul is making reference to is the nation as a whole. At the end of the age, a day is coming. A day is coming. It's going to be a time of sorrow and tribulation. It's a time spoken of by Jeremiah the prophet in chapter 30, verse 7. He refers to it. As the time of Jacob's sorrow, of Jacob's tribulation. Remember, Jacob becomes another word, a name for Israel. At the end of the period, a deliverer will come. And a believing remnant will enter into that kingdom. And the nation Israel will be saved. That means A redeemed and regenerate group of people will see their Messiah. Let me just give you a brief understanding of the way that I think it's going to unfold. The human nations, the Gentile nations, the nations of this earth are going to gather together at the end of the age in opposition to Israel and to the nation. And that a real Jesus will return to that nation. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah 59, 20, it says, And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from the transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words which I have in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth nor out of the mouth of your seeds seed, says the Lord, from henceforth and forever that the coming of Jesus, the manifestation of Jesus, the revelation of Jesus is going to really turn people To the Lord. Zechariah 12.10. We've repeated this over and over again. The prophet Zechariah says. I will pour upon the house of David. These are Jewish people. And upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The spirit of grace. And of supplication. And they shall look upon me. Whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him. As one mourns for his only son. And it shall be bitterness for him as one has the bitterness for his firstborn. Now pay close attention to Paul's statement. And to those who turn from the transgression in Jacob, Jesus comes to Zion. The transgression in Jacob, Jesus comes to the Jewish people. I want you to just really think this through. Jesus comes to a Jewish people in a Jewish city, in a Jewish future. And that the coming of Jesus will have a specific result. And shall turn ungodliness from Jacob. The blindness is lifted. The hardness now becomes sensitivity. It's almost as if the fog lifts and normal spiritual perception returns it's sort of like what you experience from time to time you come to church you read your bible you sing the songs you get involved in fellowship and you go yeah the bible is true and jesus is lord yeah the bible is true and jesus is lord and the prophecies are true 
And then you leave and you go out there and you watch TV and you listen to the radio and you listen to your family and you listen to your friends and you wonder, you wonder whether or not it's true. You wonder whether or not the prophecies are true. You wonder whether or not the gospel is true. It's like a fog begins to grip your mind and your heart. Paul says, It's going to be a time of restoration and mercy. Look what it says in verse 27. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Paul now quotes Jeremiah chapter 31. It's an encapsulation, an abbreviation, if you will, of Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 through 34. If you have a Bible, you might want to turn there. In Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning in verse 31, Jeremiah says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity. Remember what he says in verse 27? For this is my covenant with them. When I take away their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. Have you noticed? That with the lifting of the hardness of heart, with the lifting of the blindness comes the lifting of sin and transgression. The promise, all Israel. The person, the deliverer. The purpose, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Oddly enough, that's what's supposed to happen when Jesus shows up. When Jesus shows up, that's what's supposed to happen. Instead of blindness, sight. Instead of transgression, cleansing. In Isaiah 43, 25, It says, I, even I, am he that blots out your transgression for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. There's something nagging inside of you, I know that it is. And the nagging is, well, why do I remember my sins? Why do they keep coming back to haunt me? Why do they keep coming back to remind me of my circumstances? Because really, the most important person who has to forget about your sins is God. And this becomes the key, the key, the key, the key. God forgets about your sins in Jesus. Sin is the problem, and Jesus is the solution. And when the sin is forgiven, and the blindness lifted, and the grace and the mercy flow, here's what he's saying. The long-neglected covenant, the long-neglected covenant, the covenant that has been rejected, the covenant that's been broken, the covenant that's been spurned, the covenant that's been refused will be restored. And the magnificent blessings that were promised to Abraham and the blessings that would take place as the world experiences the joy and the blessing that comes when Israel is restored to her proper place. There's redemption. 
Augustus Montague Toplady wrote a very famous song. He said, a debtor to mercy alone, of covenant mercy I sing, nor fear with thy righteousness on, my person and offering to bring the terrors of law and of God, with me can have nothing to do, my Savior's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from view. The Savior. Jesus, the Savior, hides all of the transgressions. In verse 28, it says, concerning, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Paul offers an attitude. He basically says, look, all of this is going to take place in the future. And we're happy. What, what's going to happen in the future? The nations are going to come together. They're going to oppose God and the things of God. What else is going to happen in the future? Israel's going to be restored to the land. Wow. And then what's going to happen in the future? All the nations are going to oppose and resist Israel's presence in the land. Oh, then what's going to happen? The clock is ticking. The clock is ticking and the future is unfolding. And God's plan for the Jew is going to be realized. And the revelation of Jesus is going to come to this very real world. So what does all of this mean? That's in the future. But what about now? When Paul wrote these words... Many Jewish people seemed like enemies, but Paul reminds himself and he also reminds his reader that the Jewish people are beloved of God. And they're beloved in God's sight because of the covenants that the living Lord made with Abraham, because of the covenant made with Isaac, because of the covenant made with Jacob, because of the covenant made with Moses, and because of, of the covenant made with David. Paul presents the contrast, enemies for your sake, elect, beloved, for the sake of the fathers. What does all of that mean? It means that Paul invites you to see the Jewish people not simply for what they are, but for what they will be, for what they're going to become. Why is that important to you? Again, I ask you the question. Have you ever had a single relative, a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister, a family member, a friend, and they annoyed you because of their unbelief. They annoyed you because of the persecution. They, they annoyed you because of their stubborn refusal to come to Christ. They annoyed you because of their refusal to believe the truth about God and believe the truth about Jesus. Paul invites you to open your eyes and see not what they are, but what they're going to become. Have you ever experienced a situation where someone you love actually comes to Christ? They experience the love of God. They experience what it means to know Jesus and love Jesus. And you see the transformation takes place from what they were to what they'll become. And Paul invites you to not simply look at the Jewish people for what they are, but what they will become. When Israel is seen through the lens of the covenant and seen through the promises of God and seen through the election of God, she is beloved and this should cause your heart to well up with compassion and mercy and grace and tenderness. When we're tempted, when we're tempted, when we're tempted to see Israel as only blind and only hard, we should consider her future. Why? Look what Paul says in verse 29. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Do you understand what Paul is saying? When he says for the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable, what is he talking about? He's talking about the gift of himself. He's talking about the gift of his word. He's talking about the gift of his promises. He's talking about the gifts of of every single promise that he has ever made. 
and they are irrevocable. Times change and people change. But the promises and the covenants do not change. And this is why. This is why if Israel is ever tempted to consider us enemies, then we will love her. And if Israel is abused, we will comfort her. And if Israel is neglected, then we will offer support and encouragement because this is the truth. And listen carefully carefully to me. If Israel has no future, then neither do you. If God can break his promises to her, he can break his promises to you. If God could cease to love her, he could cease to love you. If he could cease to act on her behalf as he brings about the challenges that are going to take place. He could cease for you. If Israel has no future, then neither do you. And if God fails to honor his promise to Israel, you have no right to expect that he'll honor his promise to you. Look what it says in verse 30. For as you were disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy... Through their disobedience, he reminds the Gentile reader, you used to be disobedient to God. You used to be in darkness. You used to be in rebellion. You used to be in disobedience. There was a time of unbelief in your life. There was a time when the Gentiles, for the most part, did not embrace God. They rejected God. And then they were being saved by faith. Yet have now obtained mercy. You experienced grace, you experienced mercy, you experienced love in part through their disobedience. He's talking about the disobedience of the Jews. Verse 31, even so these also have now been disobedient that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. It's Paul's way of saying, you were disobedient and you received mercy. They are now disobedient And they will receive mercy. Verse 31. Even so these also have now been disobedient. Paul admits that today most of the Jewish people remain in unbelief. But they will one day receive mercy. Paul reminds the Gentiles that they have access to the mercy of God. And that one day God's mercy will also be accessed by the Jewish people. We live in a world that is largely broken and for every single person who accesses the mercy of God there's two more people who have not accessed the mercy of God we live in a city that remains largely unchurched and unreached even after all of these years When Paul says in verse 32, for God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. What he is saying is that God has committed both Jew and Gentile to periods of unbelief and disobedience and sin so that he might have grace on both. This is supposed to generate hope inside of your heart. That God has been patient and gracious and kind. W.H. Griffith Thomas writes the word all, for God has committed them all. He says the word all in this verse refers to Jew and Gentile viewed in mass and not individually. It's necessary to keep in mind the fact that all in some passages means all without exception. But sometimes and in other passages it means all without distinction. And it has the latter meaning here in the sense that all without distinction whether Jew or Gentile might have mercy. God isn't looking for a reason 
to exclude people, but to include people. He's not looking for a reason to condemn and judge people. He's looking for a reason to embrace them. And so Paul wants the reader to know that we can have access to God's mercy. Paul wants the reader to know that mercy is available to everyone. In spite of unbelief? Yeah. In spite of wickedness in the past? Yes. In spite of reluctantly, in a, with a hard heart and a bitterness, mocking God and mocking Christ and mocking Christianity. You mean people who have mocked God and mocked Christ and mocked Christianity can experience his mercy? Yes. Let's talk about mercy just for a second. When do we find it most difficult to talk about mercy? It's usually in reference to disobedience. Now think about the text that you're looking at. For God has committed them all to disobedience. Why is this important? Because when people have been committed to disobedience, your first inclination, my first inclination isn't mercy, it's justice. Give them what they deserve, Lord. You see a person who gets their head cut off on YouTube because they're an Israeli journalist or because they're a Christian missionary. You watch in the Sudan as a nun flees with a baby in her arms trying to save a hospital that's just been burnt down. And you watch a person take a gun and shoot her in the back. And then you watch her face go down into the dirt. And you think, Lord, you should judge these people. Lord, you should punish these people. Do you remember David's cry in Psalm 6 too? Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am faint. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are in agony. Remember, mercy by definition is undeserved help. God, David accepts God's discipline, but then he begs God not to discipline him in anger. Jeremiah asked God to corrupt Correct him gently and not in anger in Jeremiah 10, 24. David understands that if God is going to deal with him simply on the basis of justice apart from mercy, then David isn't going to survive. Justice is something that we demand for others. Mercy is something that we want for ourselves. And so Paul... Paul pleads with the Gentile reader, with the Roman reader, to look at the Jewish people and look at the Jewish future and to pray and to remember that the Lord is kind and the Lord is merciful and, and the kindness and the mercy of God. He's looking for an opportunity to express that kindness and mercy. And re again, remember, remember, mercy is not something that's given on the basis of worthiness. In Zechariah, there was a vision. In Zechariah chapter 3, Joshua is is dressed in filthy clothes. And the angel insists that, that Joshua take off his filthy clothes. Garments, And then he says to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin and I will put rich garments on you. Jesus has taken away your sin. And he's put rich garments of righteousness. He allows you to wear the very robes that Jesus robes. It becomes a metaphor, a picture of how God accepts Jesus so that when you feel filthy and disgusting and dirty and unworthy, you can say, praise God that I have a closet of clothes the robes of righteousness, but the proud, the proud, the proud can't put these clothes on. And so the proud can't receive mercy. The proud won't admit that there's a problem. The proud won't admit 
that there's an issue. The proud won't necessarily admit that they're filthy. In Isaiah 45, 22, the Lord says, Look unto me and you will be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am the Lord and there is none else. And so in this dispensation, God looks up and looks out and he says, Look to me and you'll be saved all the ends of the earth. Go north and south and east and west, whichever direction that you turn. He calls on the nations to look upon him. Frederick the Great once asked his royal chaplain to, in a single sentence, give him evidence for the Christian faith. And the chaplain just said three words. The Jew, sir. End of discussion. There have been repeated efforts to get rid of the Jews. But all have failed. Lehman Strauss wrote, quote, No man can destroy the Jew. You might as well try to destroy God as to destroy Israel. In spite of all the persecution, Israel is still a nation. He is the indestructible Jew. The king of Egypt could not destroy him, Exodus 1.15. The waters of the Red Sea could not drown him, Exodus 14.21. The gallows of Haman couldn't hang him, Esther 5.14. The great fish couldn't digest him, Jonah 1.17. The fiery furnace couldn't consume him, Daniel 3.16. The lions couldn't devour him, Daniel 6, 1. A prophet couldn't curse him, Numbers 23, 8. The nation could not, Esther 3, 8. And cannot now absorb him. The dictators can't annihilate him, Isaiah 14, 12. Unquote. Think about it. The Jews have survived the Crusades. They've survived the ghettos of Europe. They've survived the Holocaust. They've survived untold centuries of ridicule and prejudice and persecution from all the nations where they've been scattered, they'll continue. They must continue until the Lord returns. Future efforts to destroy the Jew will remain as futile as they have been in the past. Paul argues that the blindness and fall of the Jewish people have afforded a window of blessing and mercy for the nations. And Paul argues that the salvation of the Gentiles has in part become a part of God's plan so that a provocation or the stirring of the Jewish people would take place as they begin to see Gentiles everywhere who have a priest and a prophet and a king and a sacrifice and a day. Paul points to a future salvation of the Jews that will issue in a time of unprecedented blessing and peace for the world. Paul envisions a future where both Jew and Gentile are saved. I guarantee you, it will happen. The glorious future will come by God's mercy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, Lord, as we have made our way through these chapters, as we've got a glimpse into Israel's past and a glimpse into Israel's present and a glimpse into Israel's future, Lord, we begin to understand something and that, that their future is our future and that our future is their future and that there is no future unless there's a future for the Jew. And Heavenly Father, we pray that with eyes of mercy and eyes of compassion and eyes of sensitivity and eyes of deep, deep love we would look at our family and our friends, not simply as they are, but what they could be in Christ. And Heavenly Father, we pray for that same vision as we see for the Jewish people 
a deep love, a, a deep compassion, a deep, a deep sympathy, not of, for simply for what they are, but that the promises of God will in fact come true and unfold perhaps sooner than any of us realize. Heavenly Father, we know there is a future and that you occupy that future where all your promises have come true. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.